This is Rick Rowell in an ongoing series of the Mining Classroom interview series. In this interview, I have the great uh, good fortune to interview a friend of long standing. Frank, you'll notice I didn't say an old friend, <laughs> uh, Frank Justra, uh, a, a long career and an awful lot to teach. This is a continuation of our Le Living Legends series, uh, as many of the classroom attendees know. Uh, I've tried to interview people who have built multi-billion dollar mining companies from scratch, learning from their background, learning from their experience, and asking them very pointedly uh, the lessons that they learned that can make you, the audience, better investors. I I'm moving on, which isn't to say that I'm not going to uh, interview uh, geologists and engineers anymore, but I want to interview I investors uh, and financiers too. Uh, Frank Juster comes immediately to mind. I have been a customer of Frank and a competitor of Frank. By the way, I enjoyed being a customer more than I be enjoyed being a competitor for about 40 years. Uh, we were trying to discuss before we went on air how long it had been since uh, we met each other and both of us in our dotage forget the exact date. So Frank, let's get started. What I'd like you to do is give us a brief autobiographical sketch. I remember you saying your dad had been a Vancouver Stock Exchange punter, as an example, in your youth. Tell us a bit about where you came from, uh, how you came up, uh, and, and, you know, not a 40-year glimpse, uh, but a four-minute stretch, so people understand something about your bias uh, and something about your background. Okay, well, I, I grew up, thank you, Rick, I grew up uh, in an immigrant family. I'm Italian. Um, we came from Argentina when I was nine years old to Canada, not speaking a word of English. And, um, you know, we lived a very modest, we didn't have much money in, in the household. My dad worked in mines as a driller and a blaster um, and worked very, very hard. The, the, you know, underground mines, it was, it was a tough, tough job. He started out with INCO uh, in Sudbury and eventually moved us out to British Columbia. Um, and I was, um, a, a, a misguided youth. <laughs> I, I got into a whole lot of trouble as a youth and I really misspent my teenage years not really caring about school, didn't really care much about anything except making some money. Had lots and lots of jobs during school and, you know, nights and weekends and summers because uh, I wanted to have my own money. And then uh, my father, uh, having, you know, being in the mining world, used to play the penny stocks. He used to look at, um, you know, Vancouver Stock Exchange type stocks in those days, and you know, mostly they were exploration punts. Um, and he was a bit of a gambler. He loved to play poker. He liked, loved to go to the hit racetrack. That was his sort of, you know, that was his makeup. And he and I didn't get along very well until the age of 19, when I walked into the kitchen one day and he was reading the morning newspaper and he was looking at the stock quote page, which was the only way you could get quotes in those days by looking at the, uh, the next, uh, the previous day's quotes in the newspaper, and I just, and I, it, all I saw was just a whole collage of numbers, and I, and I just asked, I said, "What is that?" And he kind of looked at me like, "Well, why, why would you want to know? You're not interested in anything." I said, "No, seriously, what is that?" And he started to walk me through and explain, and overnight we developed a relationship we'd never had. <laughs> you know, overnight we had something in common. He took me to his brokerage firm in Vancouver because we lived uh, in a small town and and that was the uh that was a pivotal point in my life where I walked into this bullpen of an old old brokerage firm that is long long gone you know that only dealt in sort of the penny stocks of the day and I saw the energy and I felt the energy you know the ticker tape and people yelling on phones whatever and I thought someone here is making a lot of money and I told my dad that day, I'm gonna be a stockbroker, not knowing anything about what a stockbroker was. I just said, this looks like a great career. Now I have something to look forward to. And um, so I, you know, I talked my way into getting sponsored for the Canadian Securities course. In those days, you needed a broker to sponsor you. Uh, finished it with flying, you know, I, all of a sudden I turned from a misspent youth into a bookworm and, you know, and I passed every, and I switched from music to business finance in my first year of college. And all of a sudden I had an interest. I had a focus, I wanted to be rich. That was my driving ambition was I wanted to make money. I didn't like the idea of being poor. And so finished the course and I, I thought, I went back to this broker at this small firm and I thought he was gonna offer me a job. 
Well, he didn't. He, he basically said, you don't want to work here. This is, he says, this is a terrible place. You don't want to work here. He said, you should work for Merrill Lynch. And not knowing what Merrill Lynch was, never heard of it. At that time, it was the largest brokerage firm in the world, had offices all over the world. And he told me that they had the best training program in the industry. They would send their students, their uh, trainees to New York for six weeks. So I just picked up a phone book, called Merrill Lynch office in Vancouver. I guess it must have been a slow day for the branch manager. And he, he said, sure, come on in. And <clears throat> I went on, bought a three-piece suit and uh, off the rack and walked into his office and started to pitch my case. And he stopped me in the mid-sentence and he said, you know, I, you know, by the way, I was about 20 years old. I was 20 years old. And he said, um, you know, listen, I got to stop you right here. Uh, a, you're too young. You don't have an MBA and you have no work or sales experience. We only hire people at the age of 25 or older that have already had experience or an MBA. And he basically threw me out. But as I was leaving, I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. And I remember turning around as I was walking out the door, I said, by the way, if you ever hire me, I'll be the best broker you've ever had. And I turned around and walked out thinking, you know, it was over. I would never hear from him again. Three months later, he calls me and he says, listen, I can't make you a broker. but We're getting very busy on our Vancouver desk. We need a junior assistant desk trader. Uh, in those days, Merrill Lynch didn't have a seat on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, so they had to gently their orders to all the local brokers. And that all the orders from Merrill Lynch worldwide would come through this desk. And all of a sudden, I was in the middle of all this action. This is 1978. And if you remember, Rick, 1978 was the beginning of that long, incredible bull market in oil and gold and silver. Everything went crazy for about three years until it all ended in 1981. So I got this education, just, it was incredible. I had to learn everything about trading Vancouver stocks. And it was, it was obviously very busy and very, you know, people were making and losing money. It was, it, and, 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 I, and I learned very quickly how that whole game worked. And then uh, one of the people at the other end of the phone, a local broker, uh, took a liking to me, like my voice. I went over to meet him one day in my three-piece suit, and he thought he was quite impressed by that. And that was the guy that started Yorkton Securities in Vancouver. And it was a three-man operation in 1980. So this is two years later after I started it. And over a period of time, we got to know each other, and he made me an offer. He said, come work for me. He was a million-dollar-a-year producer in those days. And that was a lot of money. He said, I'll give you 10% of everything I make, and you help me build my business. And I went over there, and that was the beginning of my, my Yorkton tenure, which lasted 17 years. Um, I eventually moved to London three years later to open the London office, and I moved to Zurich, opened the Zurich office, opened the Paris office. And I was still a young man, not knowing anything really about the big world of finance, and I had to learn on my feet. And um, in about 1986, while I was in London, and we opened an office in Paris as well, um, uh, I decided to create a mining team along the model that the UK brokerage firms had mining teams. And what was a mining team? It consisted of analysts, um, <clears throat> analysts, geologists, engineers, institutional salesmen, and trading. Um, and they worked together as a team to bring in business and firms. So I hired Lehman Brothers' entire mining team in 1986 or 87. And that was the beginning of what really made Yorkton in the ensuing years. And so I eventually moved back to Canada in 1990. They made me president. I eventually became chairman and CEO of Yorkton. And I stayed till 1996. And I left in December of 1986. The market was very frothy. I'd made a lot of money. I was sick and tired of the business. I hated it. I hated having to manage all these people that you know, wanted their bonuses and thought that they deserved more than the next guy. And I, I just got sick of it. I wanted out and I got out in December, 1986. And then three months later, the VREAC scan scandal hit, which if your viewers might or might not recall was a huge mining scandal. It was a $5 billion company. I think that went to zero because someone had salted the core. It was a fraud. And a lot of people lost a lot of money and gave Canada and the whole mining industry a, a huge black eye that it took five years to five years or more to recover. And so I, when I left in 86, I had no plan. I was going to just have a vacation and live life of, of leisure. I was single. I was, life was just great. <laughs> Three or four months later, I got bored. 
And so I thought I got to do something with my life. So I started Lionsgate, the film and entertainment company, which still exists today. And it's, I think, the largest independent studio in the world. Um, and it was a whim because I'd been dabbling in movies since 1986 with a small company I created on the side in Los Angeles. So I knew a little bit about the movie business. Certainly not enough to launch a major studio, which I learned shortly thereafter was, you know, I made some very hasty decisions, which ended up being mistakes, which cost me three years of, uh, of, of incredible stress to keep that company alive uh, until I managed to restructure, refinance it, bring in the proper management to run it, because I certainly was not the guy that should have been running it. Um, so I brought in great management in 2001, and that allowed me to um, step back as CEO and become chairman of Lionsgate, which I did for another couple of years. And in 2001, that's when I got my idea about gold. And if you remember, Rick, gold was $250 an ounce. Nobody liked gold. Everybody thought gold was dead forever. And I had spent months, because I was bored and I didn't have a job, um, researching, reading books, history, macroeconomics. And I developed a thesis that gold was going to go a lot higher. So I wrote a paper on it in 2001 called uh, The Tarnished Dollar Puts a Shine on Gold. And they're really clever. And and I had Doug Casey, our good friend Doug Casey, yeah. who had a newsletter in those days. I had him. He published it for me. Um, it was very kind of him. And, and you know what? It was poorly written. My gr I'd never written before. This was my first writing exercise. I write a lot now. I write for the Toronto Star. I write for lots of different publications, but that was my first writing exercise. And the grammar, I can't go back and read that stuff today because it's it was so over the top, poorly written. But the facts were bang on. And the thesis was that the dollar was going to go down in value and gold was going to go up. And on that basis, um, I made those same trades. I sold my US dollars and I bought gold. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, that's not enough. I got to do more. I know a little bit about mining finance. I did it at Yorkton. Why don't I create a gold mining company? <laughs> and that was the beginnings of Wheaton River, which became Gold Corp. And I assembled all the guys that I knew from the industry way back then, uh, before I left the industry, Ian Telfer, Jim McBurney, Pierre Lassonde, Frank Holmes, and, um, and Frank Mersh, who was the biggest swinging guy on Bay Street in those days. As, uh, he had a hedge fund. Brought them all together in a room. I said, guys, here's what I think is going to happen with gold. We should create something. And, you know, and it took a while to convince them because everybody had been so jaded, so completely thrashed by that terrible bear market that I remember Pierre Lassonde saying to me, you know, Frank, after I gave my little speech, he said, you know, Frank, you've been out of this game too long. You don't know how bad it is out there. It's terrible out there. You know, gold is all in a sense. I said, Pierre. You're too close to the action. You can't see the forest for the trees. I said, I have the opportunity. I've had the opportunity to step back and look at it from a macro level. And believe me, gold's going to go up. Anyway, long story short, we finally all got on side and we created uh, Wheaton River, uh, which eventually took over Gold Corp uh, and became, over the ensuing 10 years, the largest gold market cap in the world at one point in time, at $50 billion market cap. Uh, and one of the largest gold miners, but certainly the largest by market cap. Um, so that was an incredible experience. And as if you remember, 2001 was really the beginning of a 10 year commodity right. bull market. That, and so now I was in it and we did lots and lots of different deals. Literally dozens of companies were created over that 10 year period, some extremely successful, some less so. But we were busy. My group, at that point, I was Endeavor Financial, and uh, I bought a third of Endeavor Financial from Neil Woodyear, who is still my partner today in a number of gold companies. And um, and we had an incredible run, and in, in, you know, until 2011, and you know, it ended thereafter. But it, it peaked in 2011, and it was an incredible 10-year run. We made a lot of money for investors, a lot of money for ourselves, and uh, created some incredible companies. And then, you know, I could go on and on. And then, you know, obviously my life changed with philanthropy about seven years later. And now I'm mostly doing philanthropic work uh, with my foundations, but I'm still dabbling and creating gold mining companies and other metals companies because it's something I love. 
Well, let's let's get into a few themes in your life. Uh, uh, a, a mutual friend of ours used to work with you, Gordon Keep, uh, told he me still that does. he thought that still, still does. Pardon me. Thirty-seven years he's been with me. He's my partner yeah. for thirty-seven years. He 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 said uh, your hallmarks are that you surround yourself with very good people. You become indispensable for them. Uh, you get large positions early and you hang on for dear life. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, what I consider to be a couple of your real strengths, which is persistence and tenacity. Uh, you built Yorkton into a powerhouse. You fended off, uh, at least partially, Canaccord, first marathon. Uh, you know, it's not, like, it's not like there weren't a few guys gunning for you, uh, and you mm -hmm. successfully built something from a three-person team to a powerhouse, but you took 17 years. Uh, Wheaton becoming uh, ultimately Newmont. And, oh, and by the way, spinning off a little car, sidecar called Wheaton Precious. Uh, overnight yes, success that, that took you a decade. <laughs> so I want you to talk to me about persistence and tenacity. And, and I want you to talk about, uh, as humbly as you can, how you succeeded where other very good people failed. What are the lessons that our audience can take from this part of the Juster career? I think, honestly, the the there's one central theme in my the way that I've conducted myself over the years, and that is never give up. Because as we all know, Rick, in this business, it's tough and stuff happens, things go wrong, always something goes wrong, and um, it, doesn't go as planned, something gets in the way, and all sorts, so many factors, so many risks in this industry that it's easy to just, you know, make, uh, you know, have something happen and just think that it's over and give up and walk away. And I just never believed in giving up. I just, uh, and whether it was Lionsgate when it was going through its most difficult years in the early years, or whether it's every other deal I've done since, you know, I could talk, talk, talk to you about Eurasia, which became Uranium One, and how difficult that was to close when the 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 oligarchs that were selling me this, this these uranium mines in Kazakhstan reneged after I'd raised five hundred million dollars and put it in escrow, done the road shows, and they reneged for no reason. They were going, well, we don't feel like closing. We want another hundred million. It was just typical behavior of these type of people, and it was a standoff. And you know, I was sitting with half a billion dollars in escrow trying to close this transaction. And it was, and these guys were trying to put a gun to my head. It was, and honestly, I had to play a bit of poker with them. And, you know, I, I remember someone once telling me that there are times in life where you have to be crazier than the other guy, a little bit crazier than the other guy. So I had to pretend that I didn't care and that I'd gone crazy and I was gonna give the money back. And I just was fed up. Anyways, I had to, it was a bluff because I had no cards in my hand. They, these guys were just not playing by the rules. Anyway, so it's it's about never giving up. It's about finding ways to make things work, having a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, always in the back of your mind when you're doing anything. I always think, what if that doesn't work? What's your plan B? And then if that doesn't work, what's your plan C? Always have a backup because you're going to get surprises. And so it, the tenacity of not accepting defeat. And there were times, especially with Lionsgate, where people very close to me were saying, Give it up. Declare chapter 11. Lots of people do it. It's not going to be that bad. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I, I thought I was looking at someone with three heads. I'm not going to give up. That's just not in my makeup. And so I think that that's really the tenacity. Just keep fighting and fighting until you find an angle to make something work. Part of your ability to be tenacious uh, has been that you have aligned yourself with the good years and the keeps uh, and those people. And if if you would say that that's true, tell me if it's not, by the way, to disabuse me when I'm wrong. Oh, it is. Uh, how do you find uh, both the guys that you partner with? And in the old days, I mean, you had a stellar team that you underwrote. I think back to the old days, you, wrote, you, you raised money for Clive Johnson. Uh, let's just say before Clive was Clive, you, made money, you raised money for Robert Friedland, when he wasn't a household word. How do you, uh, in your own mind, what traits do you look for? Because what I want the audience to come away from 
is that most of the action is done by a very few people. The living legends are where yeah. you make your money. How do you find the living legends before they're overpriced? Through experience and experience is good and bad. Okay. So you, you know, the fact that I've been doing this for 45 years and I started really at a very early, you know, I was 20 years old when I got into this business and I got into the game very quickly and understood who was who figured out who the better mining executives and promoters and the guys to align with. And then along the way, you make mistakes with people and you learn what to look for and you learn who to avoid. And I, you know, I developed a, a policy a long time ago that I don't deal with dicks. I just won't. I just, I don't care who they are. If, if, if they're not a good character, I just, it's, life is too short. So it's through trial and error, Rick. And then it's gut. You get a gut. Someone walks into my office today pitching something and it's someone I've never met before. I just watch everything. I watch what they say. I watch their body language. I've had, I have enough experience that I may not be able to pinpoint where something is wrong, but my gut said, my gut tells me right away, no. And that's just, you know, you, you get that intuition when you've done a million deals. You just have an intuition of what sounds right, what sounds plausible, what sounds bullshit. <laughs> and so you just learn. And, and then along the way, you pick up people that, that you have great experiences with. For me, Ian Telford, Neil Woodyard, um, and uh, uh, who else have I done? Uh, Fino, Yakino, people that I've made money with before. And you understand their strengths and their weaknesses, and we all have them, okay? Like, I, <laughs> I've got mine. But you, you, if you understand their strengths and weaknesses, you can assess how to handle them, how to manage them. You know, I don't always agree with my partners. You know, I've had many disagreements with Telfer, with Neil Woodyear, and uh, millions of disagreements with Fino Yak. No. Um, but, you know, you know the devil you're dealing with, and you understand that they're good at what they do. And everybody's got a slightly different talent set of talents, but you understand what they're good at, and you stick with those people. So I end up doing deals with the same people over and over again. And occasionally I bring someone new in um, that I try out because I feel I have a good feeling about them. But it's normally I do business with the same people over and over again because I know what I'm dealing with. And I trust them to a point. <laughs> so you were a trader, uh, you were a banker, you were a financial services executive, you were an entrepreneur, financier, investor. You know, you pretty much ran the gamut. Uh, thinking back uh, across these constituencies, thinking about the investors, what do you see as the most common mistakes that, uh, what do most people get wrong? What did your dad get wrong? I mean, he was a miner. He should have known about mining, but he didn't make any money in mining stocks. But let's, let's not make it personal. Let's go forward. You've, you've probably watched, I don't know, 30,000 retail investors, a whole bunch of institutional investors, a whole bunch of brokers. And the truth is most of them never make it. Are there some common mistakes that you see? Are there some, why are people so good yeah. at shooting themselves in the foot, Frank? Because I think it's human nature is guided by greed and fear, Rick. Okay. Th those are the two driving forces that drive human decision making. And when you understand that those are the driving factors, people make the same mistakes over and over again. I won't name names, but I got people that are very close to me that have been doing this for a very long time and still make the same silly mistakes because they're dry, you know, first of all, they they believe what everything they hear, which is number one mistake you should ever make. You know, you, you hear a story and you have to really do due diligence if you're gonna invest a lot of money. Like I never buy on, I, I stopped trading a long, long time ago, but you know, because someone said that, you know, this is a great idea or not, you know, you, you do your homework. And then, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they don't sell. You know, they buy something right, and then they watch it go up, and then it, it, it may have a spike to a higher number and then pull back a bit, and they go, oh, shoot, I wish I would have sold at the peak. I'll just wait for the next time it peaks to sell. And they 
and and, and that never happens. And they and they keep watching these peaks on the way down, and they keep hoping for that last peak to give me just one more chance. And I promise that next time I'll sell at that last, at, the, at the most recent peak. That is such a classic mistake. And I always tell people, you know, in this business, people always I, I put people into deals on one condition. I said, never ask me when to sell. I have no idea. I don't know where, how high this or this share price, how well it's going to perform. I said, I tell people, you know, what did you pay? Where do you feel is a reasonable profit? You know, maybe take your money out and don't wait for, you know, the next thing to, that's supposed to happen that it will drive that valuation higher. And people just get greedy and hope they, they don't want to miss the high. And they make that, that classic mistake of watching something go like this and then go like this, and they never sell. And they're waiting for that old high. I think that's classic. And then the other one is fear. And fear is a little bit more difficult because fear is a more powerful emotion than greed, much more powerful. Because when, when you're afraid you're gonna lose everything, if you don't act, you'll make a, you, you'll make a very quick decision because you're afraid. And I think that when you watch when there's a market event that takes everything down, that's when you have to look around you and understand what is actually happening here. You know, am I going to get caught in this downdraft and and just bail out and lose, you know, half my investment or whatever it is, lose money as opposed to staying calm and going, this is an event that's not going to affect the valuation long term. It's an event because events in the stock market happen all day long and, you know, all, it, they happen a lot. And so I think that it's really understanding the psychology of how to behave in markets. And I, my philosophy and the reason that I've been partially successful is because I take a long-term view when I build something. Um, and I learned this a long time ago. It's just, it takes years to succeed in building something worthwhile that's going to have long-term and lasting value. It takes years. Sometimes it takes five, six, seven, eight, ten years. And if you're trying to build something, just keep that in mind and pretend that it's almost like a private company, except when you have to finance it and go, listen, at some point it'll be worth, if we do everything we're doing here, it's going to be worth a lot of money. Patience. And I, you know, I learned patience. The irony is that I'm learning to be more patient as I get older, which kind of is, you know, it should be the other way around, you know, because obviously you have, you have less less time to do the things you want to do. But I've learned to be very patient. And I always tell the young people around me, because I mentor a lot of young people in this industry, so, you know, have a plan, be patient, don't take shortcuts, make it happen, and own big, own early, and be patient. And then if you, if, and if you have the right management, you have the right business plan or the right asset, the payday will come. And that's, that's, you know, and I do that. And I'll spend years working on a deal until it's mature enough that I, it doesn't need me anymore. You know, I, I get very, I get ADD. I, after a while, if something's successful, like when we built, we and Reverend to Gold Corp, it wasn't long thereafter that I just go, you know, I've done my bit. I can't, this company is now well on its way. I can't really add more value to it. So I stepped off the board and I was going, I got to do something else. That's when I created the uranium company. Because I thought, I, I'm good at creating something from scratch with a concept in mind. And I know how to take it to a certain level where it's mature enough that it's of institutional quality. And then I go, well, I'm not in it. You know, I'll do something else. Because the building part is the best part. It's the, it's the fun part. So, Frank, uh, in the brief time we have left, I need you to do two more things. I need you to tell me yeah. what you're doing now. Uh, how our audience mm -hmm. can, should they decide it was worth their while, participate with yep. you. And after that, I want to talk about a theme that we talk about a lot at the rural classroom, which is uh, doing good while you do well. I want to talk about your philanthropy, but let's talk about uh, yeah. let's talk about what yeah. you're doing for yourself first. Let's talk about the projects the that you're in, yeah, why you're yeah. doing so, them, who your so partners I'm, are. Okay, so I've got a formula that's worked that was kind of came together when we built Gold Corp, okay? It's called the buy and build strategy. And I've deployed that strategy quite a few times since Wheaton River Gold Corp. 
I did it again with Endeavor Mining in 2009. We launched Endeavor Mining in 2009 with a blind pool of $100 million. And Neil Woodger had to build a gold mining company with just that $100 million in equity, because as you remember, the markets changed shortly thereafter. We couldn't access the equity market, so he built it all on debt for the next six years. Um, and um, so that, and again, buy and build means you use uh, your understanding of capital markets, M&A, and you either acquire projects or mines, or you build them or both at the same time. And you start small and, you sh and your transactions get bigger and bigger and bigger until you have an institutional quality gold mining stock. So I did that with Endeavor. And then in 2016, I did it with Leia Gold, which became part of Equinox now, and I'm still a shareholder of Equinox with Ross Beatty. And then um, the latest one I did was Eris Mining in Colombia. We have two gold mines in Colombia going through expansions, both going through expansions, doing 250,000 ounces a year now, going to um, 500,000 ounces in the next 18 months. It's fully permitted, fully financed, and a massive project called Soto Norte, which is going through the permitting stages. And, and us I'm going to build. Remind us who your partner is there. Who's your partner? Neil Woodyard. Uh, what's the genesis of it? Okay, well, Neil Woodyard, uh, which I, my first outing with him was Endeavor. My second outing with him was Leia Gold. And then we, I, when, when Equinox took Leia Gold over, I said, Neil, let's do it again because I have an idea. My idea was Columbia. So it's Neil and his team. And he's kept his team pretty much intact throughout the years. Same people. Um, and they're really good at what they do. So we're building that. And my hope is that we have a path to a million ounce a year producer. That's always my objective. Get to a million ounces a year. That's a lot. It makes you a good intermediate gold producer. And obviously, you're going to be in all the index funds and what have you. So, so, so I'm building Eris, and then I'm doing a similar idea, slightly different in Ontario with West Red Lake. And that's where we bought the Manson mine out of bankruptcy for very low cash. Um, it, it was a perfectly good mine, perfectly good ore body, rushed into production with a ton of mistakes by previous management, all mistakes that are, in our opinion, easily fixable. And with our management in place now, which is Shane Williams running that company, he came from Skeena Gold, um, good underground miner, knows his stuff. Uh, we're going to put that back into production. We have to, you know, obviously go back to the drawing board, develop and uh, drill out the ore body a little bit more close, close, closer spacing so that you could have a proper inventory ahead of you before we start mining. And my objective there is to, because that prop mine is in Ontario, is to use that vehicle to look at other opportunities in Canada because there are a lot of single mine operations in Canada. And single mine operations don't get a lot of institutional attention. They're almost orphaned. And so my concept is to grow using West Red Lake as the vehicle, get that back into production, and then make some other acquisitions to make that bigger than just 100,000 ounces a year in production. So I've got similar plan, only it's in Canada as opposed to Colombia. And I'm always looking at other opportunities. Um, I started, uh, I took control of Libero Copper uh, last month, I think, um, which was uh, has a great project in Colombia, Copper Porphyry in Colombia. Um, you know, they ran out of money. They couldn't finance it. They came to me, took control of it, and we put a bunch of money into it. And we're going to go there and create a copper company. I want to create a, I want to create a copper company much like we created a gold mining company. So Libero is going to be the vehicle there. And, you know, we'll see how that works out. I've got a plan in my mind of how it's going to unfold, but, you know, it's all about execution. So, you know, that'll take, you know, one or two or three years to get up and running. So those, those finally, are the mining Frank, deals uh, that I'm doing. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm just saying, those are the mining deals I'm doing. Like I said, my life is most, mostly my philanthropic work and my writing. I write a lot now. For, I write monthly columns and um, and, and I'm the co-chair of the International Crisis Group, which is a global organization that tries to prevent, prevent wars, which keeps us very busy these days. I've got my foundation in Latin America called Accessa, which is a poverty alleviation um, foundation that works in multiple countries to bring people out of poverty through market-driven solutions. And, and I've, been, I've thrown well over $100 million of my own money into creating that model to prove that it works. And it took me years and years to make sure that I had a model that works. And now we're attracting huge 
um, sums of money from bigger institutions to help us expand that and take make that a global organization. That one's my life's work. I'm going to spend the rest of my life because we created a model that's very unique and it works, and I want to take it worldwide. So that's Accesso. <clears throat> I, I'm a co-founder of the Global uh, uh, Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, which is in partnership with the government of Canada and UNHCR and Open Society. And we created, took the Canadian model of private sponsorship of refugees, and we're taking it worldwide, spreading that model around the world. We've already resettled a million refugees uh, properly into communities so, so, so that they get assimilated and they, they, you know, the kids go to school, people are part of the community as opposed to creating what normally happens is a place like Europe where refugees come in and they're in a ghetto and they stay in that ghetto. We, we try and disperse them throughout communities across. And it's a model that's worked in Canada for over 40 years. Started with the Vietnamese boat crisis back in the late 70s. And so we took that Canadian model and we're taking it around the world. So that's that's interesting. And I and I have a lot smaller foundation stuff that I do locally and internationally. But those are my main ones. And it takes up a lot of my time. And I love it. I absolutely I found my peace in that. That's my purpose in life. And it gave me peace um, and uh, and happiness. I'm like I love, love what I do. That shows Frank. Um, we are out of time. I, I want to allow, allow you to return to your philanthropic endeavors. Uh, but I want to personally thank you for the time that you've taken uh, with the Real Classroom. Uh, I want to thank you, too, for the successes that you've enjoyed, uh, and particularly for taking me along on some of them. <laughs> that's always, that's been pleasant. Uh, I look forward to more of these discussions, uh, if you're up for it. But once again, thank you so much, Frank. I look forward to visiting with you again. Rick, it's always a pleasure.